as good as it gets when it comes to covering basketball, college basketball. John Fanta joins us from the field of 68 right here on 365 Sports and also college basketball on Fox, broadcaster, reporter, and more. Thanks for your time, John. We always love your work. Appreciate what you do. So uh, we're down to 16, and there's just the one double seed, of course, with uh, NC State and what run they've been on. Can you try to uh, explain what they've done and we're used to people slipping into the Sweet 16. They're a big boy school and a program, but your thoughts about what they've done? Yeah, what NC State has done is is amazing, guys. I mean, it, it, this is a program that 17 days ago was 17 and 14. It's great to be with you guys, by the way. Thanks Thank for you. having me. Seven, 17 and 14, not even three weeks ago. I think Kevin Keats is going to get fired. And seventeen in, in a span of thirteen days, Kevin Keats went from being fired from being in the hot seat to a king waiting on a pretty contract extension. Uh, it's amazing, and it is it epitomizes March. They've won seven in a row. DJ Burns is one of the best stories in this tournament. Six foot nine, two hundred and seventy five pounds. Uh, he's a he's a a ballerina that's sized like a vending machine, and <laughs> this guy is just playing at another level. Sixteen and a half points close to five rebounds per game during the seven-game stretch. D.J. Horn has been terrific. They have scoring balance, which they always had. But now, you know, you get to the tournament, and I think certain teams come out tight, right? And they just don't look themselves. Uh, I felt that even this past weekend when Tennessee was playing Texas. I thought at times Tennessee was playing way too tight, uh, and they escaped. But for me, this NC State team, they've got nothing to lose. And they never had anything to lose. And when they do lose, and I think they'll lose this weekend, nobody's going to bat an eye. They're going to say, what a run. What a remarkable run this team went on. Uh, so what are they getting? They're getting great contributions from Horn, uh, from Mohamed Ziara, who's been terrific, and then Burns inside, Michael O'Connell's done enough. They just have different guys who can get them 10 to 12 points per game. Makes it tougher for you to scout. They're playing at a nice tempo. They're getting high-quality shots. And it's allowing them to be in, in games when, you know, they're not the Cinderella. They're a high major. Uh, but I think for Kevin Keats, it was like, look, guys, we can either make something of this or we can go down and, and uh, lose in the ACC tournament. Nobody will think anything of it. And I think he's got a veteran group. His group is experienced and they play like it. Yeah. How, um, how often do you think that um, they have an assistant coach spray Dave Dorr and the football coach with water to keep him out of the basketball facility to keep him away from T.J. Burns? <laughs> I know. I mean, he belongs on an offensive line. He really does. He has been absolutely terrific. He really has been. So, I mean, yeah, I would take him. I'd take him on my football team. He, he's been nails, guys. He's been terrific. Now, the question is, how does NC State play Marquette, who has a five-man in Oso Godaro, who is literally the antithesis of Burns from a style standpoint. I do not think that, that NC State can have Burns guard Iguodaro. That's just a, a, a physical mismatch because of the size compared to the, the angular length? Yeah. It's the, it's the total differences in their skill set. Burns is this huge Tonka truck. Iguodaro's Mr. Mobility. Mm -hmm. He's mobile. He can run the floor. He's great in the lane. He's great on those hook shots. I think Marquette is a problem matchup for NC State. I expect Marquette to win. John, I don't remember. Uh, it it might have been back, I mean, uh, I'm 65 in May. But there was always Al McGuire, the great Al McGuire, Marquette, speaking of that, uh, used to mention that for a team to win the national title, very few just like run through the tournament. And we've seen that yeah. more often than not. But you had to have one of those moments, uh, a tipping at the buzzer, a last-second shot, a uh, uh, Houston had that with A&M. I mean, that thing yes, was dicey. Um, does that – some people go, well, they show – does that does that kind of lead to, okay, they've had their scare. That doesn't mean there won't be any more close games. But is that something you almost need to see, even if it's not fun to be a part of it? Yeah, you have to. You have to. Al McGuire said that. Jay Wright said it when he was going on his title runs in 2016 and 18. I mean – if Chris Jenkins doesn't make the shot, we go to overtime and perhaps Carolina wins. They had the momentum at that point. Here's the deal. You, you've got to get lucky at times. For Houston, 
they're so tough defensively, but on that night, on Sunday night, the officials were calling it tight. And A&M shot 45 free throws. A&M should be kicking themselves. Yep. They only made 29 of them. But sometimes you do catch a break. When you're playing, I, I say to people this, it's not one six-game tournament. It's six one-game tournaments hmm. for the winner. You, you're in a one-game playoff every time. It's why we love this thing. And it's also why it's hard for Cinderella to win this thing because of that. It's hard for the Cinderella to have their, their absolute best for six straight games. It's why the Sweet 16 is better set up for heavyweight matches than for, for it's the Sweet 16 of David, uh, or rather of Goliath, not David. Um, you know, I think that for Houston, they, they've got an incredible backcourt in Shed, Sharp, and Cryer. Uh, with, with Emmanuel Scarf coming off a 30-point showing uh, against Texas A&M. My issue with A&M, and I'm worried about it against Duke, is Kyle Filipowski is going to be the best frontcourt player in that game, and Duke has a hot backcourt right now. Jared McCain is shooting the basketball as well as anybody left in this tournament, 30 points on Sunday against a good James Madison team. My issue with Houston is they need those top three to be great offensively for them to beat an elite team. There's not a lot of room for air for them. But you know what? There was room for air for them Sunday night and they escaped. And so for that reason, your question's very well taken in that if Houston's in this Final Four, which I picked Houston to go to the Final Four, we will look back on that round of 32 game and say, what could have been? John, uh, how do you grade? Is it fair to grade conferences by their performance in the tournament or – is that maybe a confusing metric because this thing is about matchups and who you who you draw? You know, look, if Kentucky gets any other 14 seed, they might win in a walk, but they got Oakland. You know, uh, same with Auburn and Yale. Like, what uh, what is uh, what is your grading of how a conference performs and what their value is? Yeah, you have to put the whole body of work with with what they do in this tournament, but you can't form your whole opinion off of a one game tournament. That's not, that's not right. And it also, it, as someone who covers this sport year round guys, it defeats the purpose of the whole season. If I literally do everything off of one or two games, I know that the casual fan is going to do that. I get it. I get it. It's like what they think of a team in the NFL, whether they can win a playoff game or not. I mean, the Buffalo Bills have been one of the National Football League's best teams in recent years, but guess what? In the playoffs, they've stunk. So now do we think that they're a bad organization? Of course we don't. But do they have their flaws? Yes. You could say both are true at the same time. Um, when I package this together and take a look at, at conference records, right? The ACC, the back half of the ACC right now has no identity. None. you got a lot of programs that are dead weight. Louisville's never been worse. Uh, Georgia Tech is, is kind of dead weight. Uh, it doesn't feel like, like Wake Forest is getting as close as they can, but it just feels like something's missing there. I can go right down the line. The, the Big East, the same thing. Georgetown is so far from what they've been. Um, Xavier had their first losing season since the 90s. DePaul is horrendous. Like there's some dead weight in some of these leagues. So then when they're, when some of these teams are winning tournament games now, do you say their league is the best? Their league is the best. The best conference in college basketball is the Big 12. It is. It analytically is, but the Big 12 is seven and six in this tournament. Mm -hmm. Well, I think there were some programs in the Big 12 that, that did not do a great job scheduling in non conference beat each other up in league play. And now they're here. And some of them were early exits as a result. Did we overvalue the Big 12 a little bit? Perhaps. But we can't control it. If Kansas was fully healthy and had Kevin McCullough, I really believe that they're here. I do. I believe they're in this Sweet 16. Circumstances happen, guys. Circumstances occur. NC State, um, you look at their past, you know, they, they were able to play Oakland in the second round of the NCAA tournament. Um, like, it's no disrespect to Oakland, but that's your that's your uh, your pathway after beating a very good Texas Tech team. But you get my point. We could go right down the line. San Diego State, you know, San Diego State comes into this tournament and they beat UAB, a team that I you know wouldn't have been in otherwise had they not stolen a bid. 
and Yale, who played a great Auburn team, and you could tell they played a great Auburn team because it took everything out of them to beat Auburn. So there's there's different rhyme or reason to how this tournament goes. It shouldn't form everything. It's a feather in the cap to the ACC. We knew Duke and Carolina were great. I thought Clemson was better than their seed, and it showed. But because the Big East has three teams that combined to go 6-0, and does that now mean the Big East is the best college basketball league? It does not mean that. It does mean, though, to me, that the committee did a, a poor job overall of selecting this field because, this is my last point here, and I'm sorry for the long-windedness, in my opinion, we have a Sweet 16 that's top-heavy because the committee did not do a great job in the back end of this bracket with their protocols for teams. Well, it, that brings me to, John, the, the thoughts about expanding the tournament, more teams, et cetera. And it, it all just depends on who you ask based on what they really want to do. What say you? The committee has a hard enough time fielding 68. Now we're going to put the hands of 80 teams in their, in their hands? I mean, they're, they're having trouble doing 68 teams. I, I, I am vehemently against, vehemently against expanding the NCAA tournament. It is the best postseason in sports. It does produce Cinderella stories. Oakland pulled that off over Kentucky. Yale pulled that off over Auburn. James Madison stormed past Wisconsin. We do not need to be talking about 500 teams and whether or not they belong in the NCAA tournament. College basketball's regular season has a hard enough time being relevant in December, January, and February. This topic fires me up, if you couldn't tell. And I really dislike the football people, you know who they are, mm -hmm. trying to insert themselves in a discussion that they have no leg to stand on. And you cannot tell me that it's coincidence that the Southeastern Conference went 5-6 and six during the first weekend in the NCAA tournament and had a massive flop. So I don't want to hear it anymore. These, whole, these ideas and theories about expanding it only benefit more mediocre high majors Forget it. We should not expand the NCAA tournament. You know what's going to happen when we expand the NCAA tournament? More coaches are going to lose their jobs, even if they make the NCAA tournament. Because it's going to be so diluted that that's not going to be a proper reward. People are going to want you to win a tournament game. Think about that. The coaches who are advocating for tournament expansion, be careful what you wish for. It just further dilutes everything that you do. I am not a fan of tournament expansion. I think it only benefits the football commissioners who want to make a couple more units you know how you make tournament units? You win games. The SEC missed the boat on that. Other leagues did not. I don't want to hear from Greg Sankey about why he wants to do this or that. Stay in your lane with football. Avoid basketball. Uh, I, I wish he'd stay less in the lane with football, uh, quite frankly, because he's uh, kind of autocratically doing things, John. And, and um, it's like, you know, you mentioned the coach getting fired. It's like, uh, well, I made the Bahamas Bowl. Well, we don't pay you to make the Bahamas Bowl. We pay you to right. to win more. Yeah, it's it, it's a problem. And to me, you mentioned the the regular season has enough trouble drawing eyes when there's a lot of great stuff that goes on in the regular season. Even in November when they have these tournaments, when you've got, you know, Duke playing Michigan or, you know, Michigan State and Kansas or Baylor and Gonzaga and all these great things early on, they need to highlight yep. that stuff more. That way when they get into the conference season, which most of these conferences are pretty good, uh, whether you're a power four in football or not, you've got a lot of great conferences that the network's really aren't pushing enough to get enough eyes on on them at all yeah i i totally agree and you know i don't know how you guys feel about college basketball in general but i can tell you right now january and february in this sport has become so much fun every mm -hmm. night something happens the bubble talk is real mm -hmm. um, you see drama emerge you know i i can't wait i mean as someone who covers this sport closely I think we could be in for our greatest Sweet 16 in over a decade. Uh, I just think that there's so many great teams here that are left standing. All the teams that we talked about all year between Zach Eady and Purdue, Connecticut's greatness. We just talked about Houston. We can go right down the line to Carolina, to Creighton, to Tennessee with Dalton Connect. Like The matchup between Dalton Connect and Baylor Shireman in Tennessee Creighton is absolutely terrific hoop. We could get the Caleb Love Bowl this weekend between oh. Arizona and North and North Carolina. Like, but that's all developed off the off the transfer portal and off the regular season. Uh, that 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 all builds, and 
I do think college basketball, you know, whereas in college football these past couple of years, we get to week seven or eight, and all anybody wants to talk about on a debate show is who the top four are going to be. Who's going to make the playoff? Who's going to make the playoff? Right now in college basketball, what's great about this tournament is it's not limited to one area of the country. We're talking about teams from all over the nation, east, west, south, north, and you're going to see this weekend these teams keep vying for a prize in one-game playoff situations. I I think the state of college basketball is in a great place. Uh, There are some things that need to get shifted, but this tournament should never. Well, and you think about this when we we look at the the mid-majors or so-called Cinderella's. There was a time when Gonzaga was a Cinderella. Uh, Creighton's got a really good uh, basketball history, and they're trying to get back to another uh, deep run. And and, uh, and love what Coach McDermott did. They dismissed the Baylor last year in the second round. It, I love what you're saying because we've, we've all said the same thing, not just that we brought you on because I did not know your take on that. I do get to watch some of your segments with Goodman and Douster and others too, but yeah, why mess something that's so good just because maybe there's more money? I guess mm-hmm. that's the way it is. Yeah. If, if, if you look at the 16, John, John Fanta, the field of 68, also college basketball analyst uh, as well, and broadcaster, you have the NC State, that's a that's the kind of a Cinderella, but still a, a basketball school. You have a six, sure. a, a six Clemson and a five San Diego State. Uh, yes. Do, do you have, is there, a, is there a Cinderella other than North Carolina State, or is everybody oh. pretty much, yeah. There's not a Cinderella, but it makes for a better second weekend. Right. It may, you know, Cinderella's only great until the magic runs out and she gets blown out by 30 in the Elite Eight. Mm-hmm. And then it produces less viewers there, and it produces a potential dud. Um, it, it, we had a mix. We had first-round upsets. We had Yale. We had Oakland. We had James Madison. We had a couple others that emerged. But I said this before, and I'll say it again. The committee put six Mountain West teams in mostly because they beat each other. That's a mistake. You've got to evaluate who you're beating. You've got to evaluate non-conference scheduling. You've got to do a better job because Virginia did not belong in the NCAA tournament. They didn't. And now looking back at it, Clemson Clemson blew the doors off New Mexico, who stole a bit. They were not going to be in. Mm -hmm. But Boise State, no show their tournament game. I, I just... I think that we've got to evaluate better as a whole with the bottom. But that's part of the reason why when you're saying, is there a Cinderella? Cinderella's carriage is not pulling up to this Sweet 16. But I'm telling you, I think it makes for some better matchups across the board. Houston and Duke. Duke's got one of the best backcourts in the country. Houston does too. Uh, we, we get uh, Clemson, we get uh, Creighton in Tennessee. You know, we get Purdue and Gonzaga. Yeah. Like, Gonzaga is no longer a Cinderella. You know why? They've been to nine straight Sweet 16s. That's the longest streak in college basketball. We get Iowa State versus Illinois. Iowa State has the best defense in the country. Illinois has the best offense in the country. So I'm telling you guys, I I know we don't have the 13 or 14. I would have liked to see one Cinderella. We don't have that, but I do think it's going to make for better all-around matches. I think you will wake up on Friday after the first day of the Sweet 16 saying, man, I can't wait for what tonight holds because Uh that was pretty wild last night. That felt like a Final Four game, but it was played during the Elite Eight or Sweet 16. John, uh, would you care to take a swipe at the Louisville coaching job and what they're going to do there? Because um, it feels like they doubled down on getting Scott Drew, which was a mistake because he wasn't leaving Baylor. Uh, And then now, like it seems like their field is drying up a little bit. Yeah, I, I do think that their that their field has dried up a little bit. I also I also wonder uh, if Josh Schertz is emerging here, the Indiana State coach who's still in the NIT. You know, for me, like Pat Kelsey's on the radar from Charleston. Well, if Pat Kelsey was the guy, wouldn't you have hired him by now? Richard Pitino has emerged on their list. Uh, I think that, the, and that would be fascinating. Although <laughs> I just don't, I don't see how Louisville can hire a Patino. I, I, that that to me seems like it's too far fetched. Maybe I'll be wrong and eat my words. Richard had nothing to do with the Rick Louisville era, other than the fact that, well, he is his son. Uh, but but we'll see. I 
I uh, I do think Louisville's at a crossroads. It's not going to be Scott Drew. It was never going to be Scott Drew. I think this, you know what this says to me, guys? That Louisville is no longer a blue blood program. It's no longer a top 10 job. It's a passionate fan base. It's a, it's a quality job, but there's been so much damage. There's, this is like, here's what I liken it to, right? You guys in your neighborhood or area, is there a, is there an establishment? There's got to be an establishment. I won't name any names to call anybody out, but 25 years ago, they made the best, they had the best food, the best of the best. And the place is still around, but the place has gotten lapped and they're still trying to be open for business because of who they were 25 years ago. And they're no longer that. They're no longer that. You can't do things. You can't be the same who you've been forever. And it just, I get an Oakland, now Vegas Raiders vibe from Louisville. I think the brand is big. I think the fan base is huge. But I think their dysfunction speaks for itself. And I think that anybody who's, who's looking at this job, who's currently got a nice job, is too afraid of doing what Chris Mack did. Chris Mack left Xavier, a, a very nice job, for Louisville. And within three, four years, it didn't matter that at one point his team was going to be a, you know, was one of the best teams in college basketball. It ended. It ended over drama and dysfunction and just a lack of building culture. It, it is a massive rebuild there. And if you're Duke, Kentucky, or Carolina, and that job opened, even if you were at your worst, it wouldn't be looked at as a massive rebuild. We should never look at a top 10 job as a massive rebuild. To me, Louisville is now a large rebuild and something that other high major coaches don't want any part of because of the scars they've seen from their colleagues. When the Drew speculation, which was mainly made from somebody obviously leaked it, the Louisville media, I can see why they would love that. Uh, I sent a note to an administrator at Baylor, and the response to me was, "This is no. if this was 10 years ago, if this was 2012 or 13 or whatever, then maybe Scott at least looks. But now he's built what is, even though the last three years have ended quickly, he has built what is a brand new arena that he helped build, and then obviously the national title and his recruiting is great right now too. So Louisville and men's basketball, and I, this pains me because I'm a Nebraska guy. Are they Nebraska in in basketball? What Nebraska yeah. is in football? Yeah, it feels that way. Yeah. It really does. Because because again, there's a following. They rate on. Well, I will say this: TV executives tell me there's a bit of apathy in terms of their viewership. Like. It's one of those things where, yeah, the brand is there, but it's kind of got Georgetown to it. Mm -hmm. Like, it's been a while since they've been good. Georgetown's the same way. Like, we talk about these schools and what they're known for. Like, the Patino era seems so far ago in in Louisville. Think about this. You know why it seems so far ago? It wasn't that long ago. It's been in the last decade that he was the coach there. When, When they play their first game next season, They will have now had six different head coaches between interims. And those interims, like David Padgett served a full season. They will have had six different coaches lead their team, go to press conference, represent their program in the last nine years. Yeah, you can't do, you can't, you cannot have instability. And, and it, hey, I got to ask you one more thing. John, you've given us more time than we asked for, but we appreciate it. I saw the interview pinned at your Twitter feed or X with uh, Bill Murray. How much fun was that to have a chance to visit with him about a year ago? The best. The best. He, he was awesome to visit with. He told me a story, uh, you know, a story about being a dad. He said he wasn't always the best dad, uh, but he's making up for it now with his kids. His son Luke is on the UConn staff, was at Xavier but now on the UConn staff doing a great job with Dan Hurley. Uh, I think Bill was getting ready to go to a birthday party in Vegas that was going to go till about 4 a.m. He told me to get a chicken fried steak in Texas, not a country fried steak, a chicken fried steak. And he was just hysterical. He had me, he had me laughing. He was a great guy. I think he's very misunderstood. Uh, I kind of walked up to him and said, Hey Bill, do you have a moment for me? And he didn't even flinch. He goes, sure. Uh, I think a lot of people have seen him as a different type of guy. You know, apparently he's been a bit abrasive in the past to certain folks. I could tell you, 
my interaction with Bill Murray, uh, you know, they say never meet the stars. I met a star. I thought he was awesome. He couldn't have been nicer to me, and I love talking with him. Ah, uh, he's one of my favorites ever. I know Paul's too, and and he's been to Waco to watch Baylor. Yeah, uh, a, a handful it, of times. John, I was. Let's see, Smokey and I probably had a streak of at that point, like all of the home games minus maybe one or two and Xavier rolls in to play Baylor and we're on the road doing something and Bill Murray's yeah, there. And he's sitting I was the, so yeah. we're eating dinner that night and they like keep showing him at, well, we're at the sports bar. They keep showing him. Am I here at the stupid, whatever we're at? I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> like, uh, we were probably at, uh, I don't know where we were. were I don't know. Where know we're. But we were somewhere. A, a Super Bowl. John, yeah. you're the best man. Thank you for your insight. I love the transparency and how you bust it. For Fox Sports, also the field as well uh, of 68 with Goody and, and, and Rob and them. Great job. Thanks for your time, and, and enjoy the rest of the tournament. I know you will. Thanks, fellas. Appreciate you. Enjoy the madness. Always fun joining you. Have a great night. Man, I love John Fanta. I love it. And he, he's on. 